is directed by Terrence Malick. Now generally for these I have a bunch of notes and I like to prepare, but I thought that in this case I'm going to do it like Terry does it and sort of talk about the film in a far more freeform manner and uh, sort of uh, try to figure it out in post. As lovers of film, and I think this is true of any piece of art, but I'll concentrate on film uh, because that's what I'm interested in. But I think there's a point in our lives when we're younger and we encounter a film that gives us an understanding that film is about more than just putting something on uh, to be occupied or about entertainment. And it is almost nourishment for the soul. It is connecting you with your own humanity and connecting with you on a level that teaches you that you are part of this grand human experience and that there is far more to life than watching something for just pure entertainment's sake. And there are many films along the road that I think accomplish that in different ways. Uh, for me, there were many, uh, but I distinctly remember the first time that I saw Terrence Malick's The Thin Red Line. It was playing on television and, you know, I was really into war movies. <laughs> If I go first, I'll wait for you there. On the other side of the dark waters. Why should I be afraid to die? I belong to you. But this was unlike any war movie I had ever seen up till then. It wasn't about triumphalism. It wasn't about heroism. It wasn't about the greatest generation. It wasn't about military strategy. It was a movie about a bunch of scared boys that were writing home to their mothers and girlfriends about how much they want to be home. It was a film about the complete obliteration of nature in service of taking a bunker on a hill that seemingly has no military value at all and then moving on to the next island and doing the same. It was a film about the beauty of nature and why we seem to do our best to try and destroy it every day of our lives. And it was a sort of beautiful homage to the people of that area of the world through their culture, through their existence, their peaceful existence, and through their music, through one of the most beautiful scores ever committed to film. Now after that I became really interested in Terrence Malick's cinema and I started seeking out his other films. And in 2011, when The Tree of Life was going to be released, I that was my like most anticipated film ever. I mean, just think about, you know, the people that are doing reaction videos to Star Wars trailers and think about how insane those people are. Like, that was me, but for The Tree of Life. And The Tree of Life is one of the most singular, spectacular, memorable cinematic experiences that I've ever had. It is almost cinema beyond cinema, and it is also the apex of what Malick is trying to do as a filmmaker, which is basically not even tell a narrative anymore to a point where it's almost unrecognizable as traditional narrative cinema. It's, it's, it's almost just experimental, and it's about telling story, but not even telling story, just trying to piece together images and sound and say something that is more like the fragments of a memory and juxtapose that with the grandiosity of nature and the creation of the universe. So once you do something like that, uh, which is essentially your masterpiece, you're never going to make something like that ever again, so why try? Malik has then gone on to do things that are in the same style, in the same aesthetic, in the same uh, visual language, but for things that are smaller. It was the first time in his career where he was taking his filmmaking and bringing it to the modern world. 
And honestly, there's something really jarring about that. It's like his cinema just doesn't mesh with the vulgarity of the modern world. In literature, there's different forms of storytelling. So there's the novel, there's short stories, and obviously there's poetry. And Malick, I suppose, is more akin to poetry. You know, if you start reading Milton's Paradise Lost and all of a sudden one of the fallen angels starts complaining about his Uber rating, it really just doesn't fit. And there's something like that with Malik. There was something profoundly wrong with seeing Olga Kurilenko dance around in a supermarket or Ben Affleck in the drive-in of a Sonic burger. However, it does also coincide with the time that Malik was exploring themes that were more personal to him. So The Wonder was about his failed marriages. Night of Cups, which is a film that actually really resonates with me, was a film about coping with the death of his brother. But I suppose that what we want from Malik isn't as personal, even though there are very personal aspects to Tree of Life, but I suppose that we want something from him that is far more just grandiose and universal, which is why I think that a lot of people are saying that with A Hidden Life, which is a return to uh, the past. It's set in Austria in the late 30s, early 40s. I think that's why people are saying, oh, this is old Malik again, or this is a return to form. And on some levels, I would agree with that. Now, that's not to say that his style has changed one bit. It's very much the continuation of the style that he really sort of mastered in Tree of Life. So, that's kind of why there's almost no point in critiquing the film, because if you've seen Tree of Life and if you've seen any of his recent stuff, you know whether this movie is going to be for you or not. It's the same thing, except it's set in the beautiful Austrian countryside, and it also happens to last for three hours. A Hidden Life tells the story, a true story, of an Austrian farmer who was conscripted into the uh, Nazi army and was imprisoned and ultimately killed because he refused to swear allegiance to Hitler. It's a film about resistance, about the smallest acts of resistance, those that we don't remember, those that are hidden from us. And it's a film that is celebrating the fact that these small acts of resistance are what define a life, are what define humanity. And sometimes they're very small, but sometimes we talk about them endlessly throughout history. Just think about Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat and what that ignited. Throughout the movie, people keep telling him, you know, your act is pointless. You're not going to stop the war. People aren't even going to know about you because, you, you know, you're in jail. You don't even have to believe uh, the words that you're saying. You just have to say them. And so if you're a pragmatist, I think this movie is going to drive you absolutely insane because pragmatism would have dictated that, yes, he would say the words and he just didn't have to believe them. But Malik is not interested in pragmatism. Pragmatism is about survival. And how can one lead a soulful, meaningful life if you are just about survival? It's a film about existing. It's a movie about dying on your feet rather than living on your knees. And in that sense, it's beautiful. Is it his best film? I don't think so. Uh, did I like it? Yeah, I, I really liked it. But then again, I like all of Malik's movies. So as always, thank you very much for watching the video. Please be sure to hit the like button if you like the review. Subscribe if you're new. And until next time, see ya. <laughs>